Howdy, howdy, this is Mr. Potter. We're going to be talking through the 2016 free response questions for the exam that was just released a few days ago. Um, hope you all did well on it. I kind of wanted to have an opportunity to go over these questions, so here we go. So, the first thing we have is we have a table here. It says water is pumped into a tank at a rate modeled by W of T equals 2000 E to the negative T squared over 20 liters per hour. For zero less than T less than eight hours, where T is measured in hours, water is removed from the tank given by this table here. And so we have selected times and we need to estimate R prime of two. Remember the idea here is that we're using the fact that the average rate of change is a very good approximation for the instantaneous rate of change. So what we can do is we can say that R prime of two is approximately equal to R of three minus R of one over three minus one. So I could say this is 950 minus 1190 over 3 minus 1. And I can leave my answer like this, um, but I need to make sure that I put liters per hour squared, because this is a change in rate over time. So it's liters per hour every hour that we've got here. And so this ends up being our answer. For part B, it says use a left Riemann sum with the four subintervals indicated by the table to estimate the total amount of water removed in the tank during the eight hours. And then the question is, is this an overestimate or an underestimate of the total amount removed and to give a reason. So um, if I'm going to do an interval, integral from zero to eight of R of T dt, I can use a Riemann sum to approximate this. And I'm using a left Riemann sum, which means I'm gonna be using this endpoint on the domain from zero to one. I'm gonna be using this endpoint from one to three, this endpoint from three to six, and this endpoint from six to eight. So I've got a width of one for my first rectangle, so one times 1340, plus this is gonna be a width of two for this next rectangle using the left endpoint of 1190, and a width of three for this rectangle at 950 and a width of two at this rectangle, which is going to be uh, 740. And so this would be a good approximation of this. Keep in mind that I'm integrating a rate over time, so this is going to be liters. And again, because they gave us units, it's gonna be a good idea to make sure that we have units in our answer. And I need to make sure I answer the other part of the question, is this an overestimate or an underestimate? Notice that we know that our function is decreasing. So if I'm using a decreasing function and a left Riemann sum, because I'm using the left endpoint, my left Riemann sum will have all of this, which is extra, not, not part of the area under the curve. And so that means that for a decreasing function, a left uh, Riemann sum is going to be an overestimate. So because R of t is decreasing on the interval 0, 8, uh, the left Riemann sum is an, un an overestimate. So notice here to get the full credit, I need to have my approximation. I need to have that it's an overestimate and I need to have my justification because R of T is decreasing on that interval. So what we're gonna do is add this up. So we're gonna have 1340 plus two times 1190 plus three times 950 plus two times 740. And again, the only reason that I'm doing this is because on the next problem, I'm gonna need this value of 8,050. So I'm gonna use this value on the next problem. So going on to the next part, it says use the answer for part B to find an estimate of the total amount of water in the tank to the nearest liter at the end of eight hours. Keep in mind that the total water is going to equal the total amount in minus the total amount out. So looking at this, I'm going to have to do the integral from zero to eight of the function they give us w of t dt minus the total amount out, which we just calculated to be 8,050 
liters. So again, I'm going to go back to my calculator and I want to find the integral of W of t, which is 2000 uh, e to the t squared divided by 20 with respect to t from 0 to 8. And I get 76,701 minus 8,000, which is going to give us the number of liters that we've got at the end of part C here. Okay. So on to part D, it says for 0 less than t less than 8, is there a time t where the rate at which the water is pumped into the tank is the same as the rate at which water is removed from the tank? Explain why or why not. Now, the key here is that R of t is going to be a continuous decreasing function and W is going to be a continuous increasing function. And because of continuity, there, there's going to have to be some point at which these two points intersect. So my justification for this is the intermediate value theorem. So the thing is because R of t is continuous on the interval from 0 to 8, R of t attains every value in the range from 700 to 1340. And similarly, uh, because uh, W of t is continuous on the domain 0 to 8, then W of t attains every value on the domain from, it's going to be from 2000 to whatever e to the negative 64 over 20 is, which is going to be something uh, very close to e cubed. So, but the idea here is that because we attain every value on this range and every value on this range, uh, because the ranges intersect, there is at least one t where w of t equals r of t. So that's our justification here. And of course, the tool that we're using here is this intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem is what allows me to justify that I actually hit every point in here. So I really should say by the intermediate value theorem. And this is true by the intermediate value theorem as well. So that's question one. Let's move on to question two. On question two, it says at time t, a position of a particle is moving in the xy plane is given by the parametric function x of t, y of t, uh, where dx dt is given by this differential equation. The graph of y consists of these three line segments shown here. And it says at t equals zero, we're at the position five, one. They want us to find the position of the particle at t equals three. So I know that x is going to be equal to five, which is my initial x value plus the integral from 0 to 3 of dx dt, uh, dt, which is going to be equal to 5 plus the integral from 0 to 3 of this t squared plus sine of 3t squared dt, which comes out to be 14.337. And I can look from the graph um, to find out what y is going to be at that point. y, when t is equal to 3, is exactly halfway on this line segment, so y is 1 half. So the position is going to be the point 14.337 and 1 half. So I found the position. Now I need to look at slope. Remember that slope is going to be the change in y over the change in x, but because we're parametric here, this is really going to be dy dt over dx dt. 
So I need to figure out what y dt is and dx dt is when t equals 3, and that just means substituting 3 into this function. So this is going to be 3 squared plus the sine of 3 times 3 squared over and d y dt is actually going to be the slope of this line which rises one unit and runs two units so over one half and this is a beautiful way to leave your answer but because it is calculator section you could say that it's 0 0.050 that would also work for part c they want us to find the speed of the particle remember that the speed is going to be the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. So I'm going to have to substitute this in what happens when t equals 3. So for us it's going to be the square root of uh, 3 squared plus the sine of 3 times 3 squared squared plus dy dt which we saw was 1 half squared. And again this is a perfect form that I could leave my answer in if I really wanted to but I could also type this in my calculator and get 9.969. Again, the thing to be careful for here is that when, because I'm using a trig value, I need to make sure that I'm in radian mode for part uh, B and part C. So make sure you're in radian mode when you're doing these calculations on your calculator, otherwise you could run into some problems. So moving on to part D, says they want us to find the total distance traveled by the particle from t equals 0 to t equals 2. Now the way we would normally find this is we would say that the distance equals the integral from 0 to 2 of that speed that we just found. So x prime squared plus y prime squared dt. The problem is from 0 to 1, y prime in this case ends up being negative 2. But from 1 to 2, y prime is 0. So because y prime is constant and different on these intervals, I really need to treat this as the integral from 0 to 1 plus the integral from 1 to 2 of each of these terms. So I'm going to have the square root of t squared plus the sine of 3t squared squared plus negative 2 squared dt plus and then the integral from 1 to 2 of the square root of t squared plus the sine of 3t squared squared dt again because my y prime is 0 on here that's missing and so I'm going to need to evaluate this on my calculator and calculating it out I get 4.349 so I get a pretty straightforward question on here so that's our calculator section, that's problems one and two. Moving on to problem three, says the figure above shows the graph of the piecewise linear function f, and it says for negative four less than or equal to x less than or equal to 12, the function g is defined by g of x equals the integral from two to x of f of t dt. Now keep in mind that g is defined as the area under the curve f of x from two to some point, so it's going to be helpful if I think of these as triangles that I'm going to find the area. So I know that this area here of this triangle has a base of 2 and a height of 4, so its area is 4. And in fact, all of these right triangles are all going to have an area of 4. The only thing I have to be careful of is that these values are actually going to subtract from the integral here. And these values here are actually going to subtract because I'm moving backwards on the domain. So I could think of these as negative amounts as well. And similarly, I could think of this triangle as a positive amount because I'm subtracting a negative. So the question is, does G have a relative minimum, a relative maximum, or neither at X equals 10? Justify your answer. So I'm looking to see G has a minimum if g prime is less than 0 on this interval from 8 to 10 and g prime is greater than 0 on this interval from 10 to 12. Well, let's see, g prime is really f. And what I notice is that g prime is less than 0, but g prime on this interval is also less than 0. So the question is, do I have a relative minimum, relative maximum, or neither? I actually have neither. 
because g prime is less than zero on the domain 8 10 and the domain from 10 to 12. So I would need some type of transition from negative to positive or from positive to negative in order to have extrema here because I don't because g prime is strictly less than zero on both of these domains then I end up with a neither solution. On part B though we're talking about points of inflection so we're looking at concavity and keep in mind that if g prime is f then g double prime is really going to be f prime or the slope of f. So what I'm looking at here is I really want to look at the slope of f at the point in particular at the point x equals 4. So notice that g double prime is greater than 0 on the domain from 2 to 4 because my function is increasing on this domain. And g double prime is greater than, uh, excuse me, is less than 0 on the domain from 4 to 6 because my graph is decreasing. So what we've got here is we have a point of inflection at x equals 4 because, so g has a point of inflection at x equals 4 because g double prime is greater than 0 on the domain 2, 4 and g double prime is less than 0 on the domain 4, 6. So again, I, in order to know what g is behaving, I need to look at the behavior of f. In particular, I need to look at the first derivative of f, or the slope of f. Moving on to part c, it says find the absolute minimum value and the absolute maximum value of g on negative 4 less than x less than 12. I know that extrema occur on critical points and boundary points. Now, I know that I'm going to have a critical point wherever the derivative is undefined, which is going to be at all of these corner points, or where g prime equals 0, in other words, where f equals 0, which happens here and here. And then, of course, I've also got my boundary points, which I'm going to have to consider as well. And remember that I thought of these areas as triangles, all of which have a value of 4 or negative 4. And because we're going from 2 to the x value, we're actually going backwards on this domain. So this is a negative 4, this is a negative 4, and this ends up being a positive 4. So let's start with the simple one. g of 2 is 0 because the integral from 2 to 2 is going to be 0. So g of 2 is really equal to the integral from 2 to 2 of f of t dt, which is 0. g of 4 is going to be the integral from 2 to 4 of f of t dt, which is 4. g of 6 is going to be the integral from 2 to 6 of f of t dt which is going to be the 4 and the 4 here, which is 8. g of 8 is going to be the integral from 2 to 8 of f of t dt, but for us that's going to end up being negative 4. g of 10 is going to be 0 again, and g of 12 is going to be negative 4. That's 0. So now I need to take a look at what's happening on this domain as we go backwards. So if I'm doing g of 0, that's going to be the integral from 2 to 0 of f of t dt, which for us is negative 4. g of negative 2 ends up being negative 8, and g of negative 4 ends up being 4. So I notice here that at g of 2, that is the lowest of any of these values that we've got. So we know that we have an absolute minimum at the point negative 2, negative 8. And we have an absolute maximum. We have our largest value here at g of 6. So this is going to be at the point 6, 8. And I know this because my extrema have to occur either at a critical point or a boundary point. I have to get values for all nine of these points, which is a lot of work, but it's made simpler by the fact that these are all the same 
triangles, just either above or below the axis. Finally, moving on to part D on this question, part D asks for negative 4 less than x less than 12, five all intervals on which g of x is less than 0. So we can actually go back to what we've talked about before. I know that g of x is, incre is increasing on this interval because its derivative is positive. I know g of x is negative on this interval. I mean g prime is negative because f is negative. And so I'm only going to have this spot here where it's less than 0. So because uh, g prime equal to f is greater than 0 on 2, 6, I know that g is greater than 0 on 2, 6. And because the integral from 2 to 6 of f of t dt equals the opposite of the integral from 6 to 10 of f of t dt. I know that g is greater than 0 on 6, 10. I need to put some type of justification here because I need to make sure that I can explain how this area plus this area gives us a 0. And so that means that the integral from 10 to 12 because it's completely below. Uh, so because g prime equals f is less than 0 on the interval 10, 12, g is less than 0 on the interval 10, 12. And then I'm going to have to do the same type of argument over here, the fact that these are going to be our negative values and this is not going to be positive enough to bring it up. So because the integral from 2 to the negative 2 of g of x equals the integral from the opposite of the integral from negative 2 to 2, uh, why am I saying g? That should be an f, f of x. Then I know that g of x is less than 0 on the domain from negative 2 to 2. And because the integral from negative 2 to 2 of f of x dx is greater than the opposite of the integral from negative 4 to negative 2 of f of x dx, then g of x is less than 0 on the interval from negative 4 to negative 2. So therefore, g is less than 0 on the interval from negative 4 to 2 and from 10 to 12. Now, a, there's a lot of stuff to write, but the concept here is a pretty easy concept to understand. So that's question 3. Let's move on to question 4. Question 4 says, consider the differential equation dy dx equals x squared minus 1 half y. Find d squared y over dx squared in terms of y. Remember that d squared y over dx squared is really the derivative of the derivative. So what I'm really doing is I'm taking the derivative with respect to x of x squared minus 1 half y. So for me, that's going to be 2x minus 1 half of the derivative of y. But this is really going to be 2x minus 1 half of dy dx, x squared minus 1 half y. And so I've written my terms completely in terms of x and y without having this pesky dy dx in here. And so as I go through the following problems in here, I'm actually going to find this version to be much easier to work with, but I need to be able to work freely with both of these. So moving on to part B, uh, says let y equals f of x be the particular solution to the given differential equation whose graph passes through this point negative 2, 8. Does the graph of f have a relative minimum, relative maximum, or neither at this point and justify our answer? So if I look at this, I know that dy dx for us is going to be negative 2 squared minus 1 half of 8 which is 4 minus 4, which is 0. So this is a critical point. And we know that d squared y over dx squared was equal to 
2x minus 1 half dy dx, but this dy dx we know is 0. So it's really just going to be 2 times x, which is negative 4. So I'm looking at this and I find out that my graph is concave down. So that means we have a local max at the point negative 2, 8. So I use the fact that the concavity that we just found to solve this problem. Moving on, it says let y equals g of x be a particular solution with g of negative 1 equals 2, and we want to evaluate this limit. Now remember, the first thing we do when we're trying to evaluate limits is to go, into, go ahead and substitute. And so that means that the limit as x approaches negative 1 of g of x minus 2 over 3 times x plus 1 squared should be equal to g of x minus 2 over 3 times x plus 1 squared, which is 0 over 0, or indeterminate. So because it's indeterminate, it should be equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the derivative of the numerator, g prime of x, over the derivative of the denominator, which would be 6 times x plus 1. Now, if I try and substitute, I know that g prime of x is going to be x squared minus 1 half of y over 6 times x plus 1, which is 0 over 0 again. We're still indeterminate. And so we have to use L'Hopital's rule a second time. So x approaches negative 1. This is going to be g double prime of x over just plain old 6. I'm not going to have that problem with indeterminate again. But remember that g prime we solved was equal to 2x minus 1 half of our derivative, which we found up here to be 0 over 6. So we end up with negative 2 sixths. And I could reduce this to negative 1 third, but technically my answer was fine at this point. This would have gotten me full credit. And there's no reason to go on to these subsequent steps except to waste my time and to possibly introduce an error. Going on to part D. Part D says let y equals h of x be a particular solution with this differential equation, and we're using Euler's method starting at x equals 0 with two steps of equal size to approximate h of 1. Remember that when we're doing Euler's method, we're really looking at this linear y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, and we're going to be using this over two steps. So I'm going to start where x equals 0, and for me, when x equals 0, y equals 2, and my slope is going to be this derivative here, which is going to be 0 squared minus 1 half of 2, or negative 1. So my tangent line looks like y minus 2 equals negative 1 times x minus 0. And at this point, I'm interested in what's happening when x is 0.5. Remember, I want to take two steps to get to where x equals 1. So substituting in here, that's going to be 2 minus 1 times 0.5 minus 0, or 2 minus 0.5, which gives us a y value of 1.5. And so that means my slope is going to be 1 half squared minus 1 half of 3 halves. So that's going to be 1 fourth minus 3 fourths, which is negative 2 fourths, or negative 1 half. So I'm going to have y minus 1.5 equals negative 0.5 times 0.5 minus, excuse me, times x minus 0.5. And I'm interested in what's happening when x equals 1, so I'm going to substitute in here. So I've got 1.5 minus 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5, which is going to be 1.5 minus 0.25, or 1.25. And so h of 1 for us is approximately equal to 1.25 using Euler's method twice. So that's how we solve that differential equation, or at least find an approximation to the solution. And now we get to number 5. If you were on Twitter at all, this got all the rage. Everyone's complaining about funnels here. What's interesting to note here, though, is that this is just a rotation 
about, let's say, the y-axis here. So what I'm doing is I'm taking some surface and I'm rotating this about the y-axis. Part A wants us to find the average value of the radius. Remember that the average value of any function is going to be 1 over b minus a times the integral of a to b of whatever my function is with regards to my independent variable. Here r is a function of h and h is ranging from 0 to 10. So for us the average radius is going to be 1 over 10 minus 0 times the integral from 0 to 10 of my function 1 20th of 3 plus h squared dh. So this is going to be 1 tenth and then I've got a constant 1 20th which I can pull out and I can integrate this 3 is going to be 3h plus h cubed over 3 which we're evaluating from h equals 0 to h equals 10. So I'm going to have 1 200th of, now substituting h equals 0 into here gives us nothing, but substituting h equals 10 is going to give me 30 uh, plus 1000 over 3. Now this is my average radius and of course the units for length in this problem is inches. So it's important to make sure that we include our units whenever we're given units. So this is going to be our average value of the radius and this is a perfectly good answer. I don't need to worry about simplifying it. In part B, they want us to find the volume of a funnel. Well, if, remember that if I'm finding the volume of a rotation, I've got to add up all of these little cylinders where the surface, my base in this case, would be pi r squared, and my height is really delta h. So I'm going to be integrating from 0 to 10 pi times r, which is 1 20th of 3 plus h, squared times my height which is delta h or dh for our purposes here. Now pi is a constant and 20 squared is a constant so I'm going to take the pi over 400 completely out and I'm integrating from 0 to 10 this binomial is being squared so that's going to be 9 plus 6h plus h squared and I'm going to be integrating that with respect to h and this is just a polynomial it's pretty straightforward to integrate. So I've got pi over 400 times, it's going to be 9h plus 6h squared over 2 plus h cubed over 3. And I'm evaluating this from h equals 0 to h equals 10. So it's just a simple substitution. And again, as before, this h equals 0 is going to be really nice because all of these terms will drop out. So our volume ends up being pi over 400 times 90 I really should have parentheses there. 90 plus 600 over 2 plus 1,000 over 3, and this is going to be cubic inches. So that's all that we have to do here for finding the volume of the funnels to treat this as a volume of rotation because we're actually rotating about this axis here. And we're used to seeing things in terms of x and y, but what I've really got here is r and h. All right, moving on to part C, this is our related rates problem. It says the funnel contains liquid that is draining from the bottom. At the instant when the height of the liquid is h equals 3, the radius of the surface of the liquid is decreasing at the rate of 1 fifth inch per second. That means that dh dt is negative 1 fifth. And that's important because we're talking about related rates, which means I need to take the derivative of this with respect to t. So I know that dr dt is going to be equal to 1 20th of the derivative of this 2h dh dt. And for our purposes I know that h is 3, I know dh dt is negative 1 fifth, and I'm trying to solve for the rate of change of the height, oh, excuse me, this is dr dt, dr dt, not dh dt. I'm looking for dh dt. So I've got negative 1 fifth equals 1 20th of 2 times 3 times the thing that I'm trying to solve for. So I can multiply both sides by 4, so I end up with negative 4 equals 6 dh dt, or dh dt equals negative 4 sixths. And keep in mind that this is a rate of change of height, so this is going to be inches per second. And again, units are very important if we're given units.
All right, it's time for us to go to our last problem, our Taylor series problem. The function f has a Taylor series about x equals 1 that converges to f of x for all x in the interval of convergence. And it's known that f of 1 equals 1, f prime of 1 equals negative 1 half, and the nth derivative is going to be given by this expression. So I need to write the first four non-zero terms and a general term of this Taylor series. So my Taylor series, remember that this is supposed to be the sum of the nth derivative at a times x minus a to the n over n factorial as n goes from zero without bound. So for our purposes, I'm gonna start with this value. This is where n equals zero. So this is gonna be one. This is where n equals one. So this is going to be negative one half x minus one to the first over one factorial. And I'm gonna be using this for my higher order derivative. So my second derivative is going to be negative one squared times two minus one factorial over two to the second power, or one times one over four. So this is gonna be positive one fourth x minus two uh, one squared over two factorial. And I need to do the same thing for my third derivative, which is gonna be negative one cubed times three minus one factorial over two cubed, which is gonna be negative one times two factorial over two cubed, or negative one fourth. This is gonna be x minus one cubed over three factorial, plus now I need to write my general term. And remember, it's gonna be my nth derivative at a, which is going to be negative one to the n, n minus one factorial over two to the n times x minus one to the n all over n factorial. And I don't have to simplify this. I can leave this like this, that's fine. So that's gonna be my answer. Moving on to part B, it says the Taylor series f about x equals one has a radius of convergence of two. A radius of convergence of two means I'm going two units to the left and two units to the right. So I know that I'm gonna be between negative one and three. But if I'm looking for the interval of convergence, I need to know, do I have equality here or do I not? That's the question here. So I need to check the convergence at these endpoints. So the first thing I'm gonna do is check for convergence at x equals negative one. So for our purposes, when x equals negative one, remember that our generic term was negative one to the n. And this is going to be x is, actually let's go back here and get this formula real quick. So we've got this negative one to the n, n minus one squared factorial over two to the n, x minus one to the n over n factorial. So substituting everything I've got, looking for the limit as n approaches infinity. I've got negative one to the n, n minus one factorial over, I have an n factorial in the denominator and I have a two to the n in the denominator as well n factorial two to the n, two to the n, times x minus one to the n. So for this, that's gonna be negative one minus one to the n. So what I've really got here is I've got the limit as n increases without bounds of negative one to the n times, I've got n minus one factorial over n factorial, so I'm gonna have just an n in the denominator in the numerator, I still have a negative two to the n over two to the n. And the problem that I have is that this negative one to the n and this negative two to the n really give me a two to the n over two to the n with this n. And if I let my two to the n's go away, I notice that I've got a harmonic series, which diverges. And so the question is, are we less than or less than or equal? We are strictly less than. But I need to do the same check for x equals three and see what happens. So I'm looking for the limit as n increases without bounds of negative one to the n, n minus one factorial over n factorial times two to the n over, this is going to be three minus one to the n. So looking at the simplification that we've got, we've got that negative one to the n. 
I've got just an n left because this n minus 1 in n factorial leaves just an n here. And then I've got 2 to the n in the numerator and 2 to the n in the denominator, so I've got the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 1 to the n over n, which is an alternating series test because this is our alternating harmonic. So we actually do have equality here. So our interval of convergence is going to be negative 1 strictly less than x, less than or equal to 3. All right, and part C. It says the Taylor series for f about x equals 1 can be used to represent f of 1.2 as an alternating series. Use the first three non-zero terms of the alternating series to approximate f of 1.2. Um, so if I'm looking at this to approximate this, I need to say that f of 1.2 is going to approximately be equal to what happens when I substitute into the first three terms. That Remember, the first term was 1. The second term was that 1 half x minus 1 to the first over 1 factorial. And the third term was that 1 fourth 1 1.2 minus 1 squared over 2 factorial. And of course, I can leave my answer just like this. I don't have to simplify this. That's beautiful. All I've done is I've just substituted 1.2 into the answer that we got on part A. So all I've done is I've substituted here and here. And I only needed the first three terms. And the reason you'll see is going to be explained on part D. Part D says show that the approximation found in part C is within 0.001 of the exact value of 1.2. And remember that our error bound says that our error has to be less than the absolute value of the next term. So for us, that's, that next term is going to be negative 1 fourth times x minus 1 cubed over 3 factorial. So for us, that's going to be 1 24th of 0.2 cubed. So it's really going to be 0 0.008, that's 0 0.2 cubed, over 24. And 8 goes into 24 3 times, so this is really 0 0.001 over 3, or 0 0.0003 repeating, which we agree is all less than 0 0.001. So I'm using the error bound. This error bound comes from the alternating series. Whenever I have an alternating series, this is going to be true. And 1.2 definitely is in the interval of convergence, so 1.2 is in the interval of convergence, which we found before to be from negative 1 to 3. So because we're in the interval of convergence, this error bound holds, and the error find from that subsequent term is indeed less than 0 0.001. And that's our AP exam. So for everyone who took this, remember that your, your aim here to get a 5 is to get about 70% of the questions correct. Anywhere between 65 and 70% is that threshold of getting a five. And that really is your target on this. Hope you got a five. Hope you got the score that you were looking for. Thank you for following me, for subscribing. Um, thank you for watching the videos. I hope you got a lot out of it. I sure enjoyed teaching you. Once again, this is Mr. Potter. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.